just a couple things to come into the conference. Uh, Shmuel Hugo Bergman is best known for his work as a philosopher and scholar of philosophy, as we have heard. But another significant aspect of his professional life is that of a librarian, both here at Charles University in Prague uh, and after his Aliyah in 1920 as the director of the Jewish National Library. Bergman viewed the Beit HaSfarim, we'll come back to that term, the House of Books, as an important cultural institution for the new issue, and it figured prominently in his own vision of a secular Zionist cultural revolution in the land of Israel. In this lecture, I will survey and analyze Bergman's work as the head of the nascent Jewish National and later University Library, based on Bergman's own writings and lectures regarding his work at the library, as well as archival material from that period, I hope to shed new light and this largely overlooked first period of Bergman's life in mandatory Palestine. Regarding Bergman's career here as librarian in uh, Prague from 1906 to 1919, all I found was one, uh, one brief quote later that he looked back upon and said that he described his methodology at that time as, I quote, outdated but secure, an outdated collection but renewed through systematic acquisitions and organized bindery, etc. This will be contrasted with the situation in Palestine that we will hear about shortly. Also, very briefly, excuse me. This is a light. Is a Calling card, obviously. Okay. Uh, very, very one to two sentences on the National Library before Shalom, before Bergman came in 1920. Uh, the Beta Sparim Midrash Abarvanel, the first uh, round of the library, was opened in 1882 under the auspices of the B'nai Brit organization to mark 400 years from the Spanish expulsion, and hence the name of uh, Abarvanel. In 1920, the responsibility was transferred from B'nai B'rith to the World Zionist Organization, and the library was renamed Beit HaSfarim Halu'umi, the National <coughs> House of Books, later to become uh, Beit HaSfarim Halu'umi Universitai, the Jewish National and University Library. In 1920, the World Zionist Organization hired Bergman, who had been living in London for a year as the educational director of the organization, to direct the library, and he moved his family to Jerusalem to take up his new position, and here we see uh, the letter of his appointment. Regarding his transition to the library in Palestine, Bergman wrote, I quote, as a member of B'nai B'rith, I was appointed by the world president of the league, Professor Ehrman of blessed memory. However, this appointment was fictitious, for the directorship didn't really exist. It was entirely symbolic, like, like most things in Palestine at that time. And when Shishkin gave me the appointment, I had no idea of the difficulties that would await me in Israel, end of quote. Actually, Bergman's appointment was initially supposed to be temporary. He was supposed to have been replaced by Professor Heinrich Lowy of Berlin. However, Lowy was prevented from entering Palestine due to his German citizenship, and thus Bergman became the official and permanent director of the Beit Sfarim. Upon arrival in Jerusalem, Bergman met the acting librarian, whom he described simply as Mr. Cohen, at the building, Beit Ne'eman, on the Habashim Street in downtown Rehob, Ethiopia, where, uh, where a few years later Shalom would also come to live. Uh, Bergman referred to the place in his conversation with Mr. Cohen as a library and was corrected that this was no ordinary library, but rather Beit Hasfar, the house of books, a term that Bergman himself adopted later as well. With only one aged, aged librarian as the entire staff, Bergman noted the grandiose house of books was often closed. Bergman's directorship. Bergman wrote fairly extensively about the library and his career there, as did others. He authored two pamphlets on history of the library, one from 1892 until 1920 when he arrived, and the second from 1920, when he took over until 1935, when he retired to serve as rector at the Hebrew University. And here we see the two, the two pamphlets, uh, Gershon Shalom's copies. He composed additional articles as well, including the Hebrew, My Adventurous Years as a Librarian, Shantaya Hapart Ka'ot Kesafran, which is rather humorous, and his farewell speech to the staff in August of 1935, August 27th, was also published. 
Bergman became director of a primitive and highly disorganized library with few books, many of them uncatalogued and or completely falling apart, a tiny unprofessional staff in an inadequate building and with essentially no budget. While the library aspired to be the national library, not only of the Jews in Palestine, but for the Jewish people worldwide, in fact function as little more than the public library of downtown Jerusalem. As I will explain later, the whole picture became much more complicated in 1925 with the opening of Hebrew University and the decision to combine the functions of National Library and University <coughs> Library into one, a move that was formally undone in 2008, which I will touch upon later. In Bergman's first budget request upon arrival, which he wrote in German, he added the, he noted the current state of the collection in 1920. 10,000 catalog books, 27,000 non-catalog books, of which only 17,000 were bound. The rest <laughs> completely falling apart. He wrote, I quote, our first task has to be to organize the existing books so that the public can use them. As long as we don't know what we already have, it is impossible to systematically develop the house of books, unquote. Bergman proposed the hiring of four assistants with a diploma from the gymnasia to help close the cataloging gap, as well as several book binders. He pointed out that the binders would later be able to find gainful employment in Jerusalem. He described this as an example of the fact that, I quote, all of us then thought in terms of settling the land, unquote. Productive, uh, productive workers. Unfortunately, the budget, only partially approved, took a long time in coming, and Bergman was forced to, and I use a word that's used often in this context, begin to schnorr donations from friends abroad and from visiting tourists. Apparently, deciding not to wait for the organization of the current collection, he also turned to Jewish communities abroad with requests to send books. And here we see a newspaper article from Jewish Daily News in London in 1921 about uh, Bergman's request for uh, donations of books and his idea to create uh, and scholarships to the library, not scholarships, uh, subscriptions to the library from Jews around the world, an idea which is floated again now, actually. Uh, he already did it in 1921. In 1921 as well, Albert Einstein visited the library and issued a call to British Jewry to support the institution, which led to huge shipments of donated books. Sounds good, right? However, these successes led to new problems, as the donors would pay the fee only until the arrival of the shipment in Jaffa. It was up to Bergman to come up with additional cash to cover it to clear customs and move the books from Jaffa to Jerusalem. He nonetheless worked tirelessly to receive donations of books and money, and in time managed to receive donations also from governments, including, interesting combination here, France, Spain, Holland, Prussia, Italy, Australia, Algeria, Czechoslovakia, of course, Hungary, Germany, and Poland, as well as from the League of Nations. In 1922, the mandatory government passed the National Deposit Law requiring publishers to submit one copy, today it's two copies, of every new book to the library. Of course, Bergman never gave up on that good old-fashioned method of acquiring books, schnorring, as is evidenced by his ongoing correspondence with the scholar Abraham Kahana in Tel Aviv. Here we see, for example, as part of the correspondence, a 1923 letter to Kahana requesting uh, him to send books that he'd written to the library and here jumping ahead almost a decade in 1931. There's in between correspondence as well, an official thank you note uh, uh, that he had received uh, one of Kahn's books. In 1923, Bergman recruited Gershom Scholem to head the library's Judaica uh, division, paving the way for Scholem's Aliyah from Germany, with what Scholem would later describe in his autobiography as, a, quote, a fictitious salary for a fictitious position. And here we can see uh, the form that, that Bergman filled out for Shalom as a request for an entry permit from the uh, mandatory government. He describes him here, of course, he's listed as a Ravak, a single guy you know, who was engaged at the time to his first wife, Esha Burkha. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and as well, he describes him as the world's greatest specialist in Jewish books, and that there's no one like him in Israel, and therefore it's absolutely necessary to give him a permit to come to work in Israel, which did work. And here we see, signed by Bergman, a letter stating that Shalom has been, in fact, given permission to enter Palestine. Uh, Shalom's first wife, Esha, also worked at the library. And in 1927, she traveled to, the, uh, to Europe and visited libraries. And Bergman wrote her a nice recommendation letter asking the librarians and the various uh, institutions she visited to uh, give her all uh, assistance. 
By 1927, when Shalom departed the library for a full-time position at Hebrew University, he was the second highest paid employee after Bergman himself, I'm referring to Gershom, not Hesha. Shalom, as you can see from this uh, budgetary document, which includes the body salaries, you see the first uh, highest paid uh, staff member is Bergman, followed by Dr. Bergman, followed by Dr. Shalom. Uh, this was no simple feat, as we can see from this, and this fact of getting a good salary at the library was no simple feat, as we can see from this quite amusing uh, uh, pair of poems, which is actually a salary negotiation with a certain uh, Mr. Ungar, who worked in the library, wrote on the right a poem to request a raise from Bergman, and Bergman answered on the same day, Tet Zion. Uh, Tammuz, Tafresh Begal, in the summer of 1924, Bergman immediately answered with his own poem, turning down the request. Okay, so du doing poem, dueling poems on the same day for salary negotiations. Uh, returning to Esha Sholem, after Gershom divorced her in 1936, uh, she quickly remarried her recently divorced upstairs neighbor, Hugo Bergman, as is known probably to everyone. Acquiring more books was also one of the reasons for the founding of Kiryat Sefer, the Hebrew bibliography, in 1924, initially edited by Sholem. In addition to its scholarly importance, Bergman, following a suggestion that he received from Franz Rosenzweig, rightly surmised that many authors would immediately submit their new books for review, thus providing another avenue for the acquisition of books for free. Thus, when Bergman retired in 1935, he was able to report that the collection stood at 217,596 books in 296,525 volumes and approximately tenfold, um, tenfold edition of almost 200,000 volumes during his 15 year tenure, which is quite uh, impressive given the conditions that he was working in. Bergman also suffered from the lack of an office as his was also used as a meeting room by the B'nai B'rith executive. He testified to his own lack of administrative skills and the fact that he felt torn between the need to serve as an official director and his dislike of hierarchy and his emotional inclination to view his employees as his comrades his, and colleagues and not as his employees. He lamented the fact that librarians received a much lower salary than that of government employees or teachers, a situation that I know continues to this day in Israel. He was keenly aware of the lack of trained librarians in Israel and eventually found a way to send some for training in Europe and later after he decided to adopt the Dewey classification system for the library in 1924 to the United <coughs> States as well. The adoption of the Dewey system led to new problems as it was constructed in a way that was very Christocentric and was sorely inadequate for significant Judaica collections. Gershom Sholem embarked on a very ambitious complete revision creating in 1927 a new decimal system for classifying Judaic books, which became known colloquially as Shittat Sholom. The first edition was published by the library in 1927 with an introduction uh, by Bergman, and uh, the three uh, subsequent uh, editions were published as well. In 1925, the library was able to acquire the extensive collection of rare books and manuscripts in Arabic, moving on to, to Arabic uh, works as well, of the uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Hungarian Orientalist Ignaz uh, Gold's Gold's here. Here. No, here. As well. This formed the basis of what is known today as the Sholom Yehuda collection at the uh, National Library of Israel, which is one of the greatest collections of Arabic manuscripts and in Kanabula uh, in the world. Uh, Bergman wasn't interested only in books. He worked hard to develop the newspaper and periodical section of the library, proudly reporting his, at his retirement that the library currently subscribed to 2,180 periodicals which were housed in a special Katz Nelson reading room. He also embarked on a project to collect wall posters that in his words reflect the daily life of Eretz Israel. This is the beginning of what is now the massive National Library ephemera collection, both digital and physical, in which these wall posters, Pashka Villing, uh, still play a central role. In a similar vein, in 1927, Avram Shvadron transferred his renowned collection of portraits and autographs of famous Jewish people to the library. At that time, it included 2,700 autographs and 1,300 pictures. At Bergman's retirement, uh, eight years later, it had grown to 4,000 autographs and 2,800 portraits. Bergman particularly singled out amongst the uh, autographs for mention Albert Einstein's manuscript on the theory of relativity as his favorite, uh, favorite item. 
And to this day, the Schladion collection remains a, a place of honor in the NLI's archival department. Bergman had constantly struggled with the inherent tension of the library's dual purpose of serving as a national and later university, as well as a public library. In his words, I quote, it served as a popular municipal library and simultaneously as the Beta Sparin with the goal of gathering all of the books related to Judaism, unquote. Upon the opening of Hebrew University in 1925, it was decided to, in order to avoid competition and duplication, the library would serve as the official library for the university as well, and it received the unwieldy name of Beta Sparin Malouli of Universitai, the National and University Library. This combination was also the source of tensions regarding priorities for collection development as the institution was attempting to serve simultaneously two very different populations. Thus the reading rooms, this, I'm sorry, this situation continued until 2008 when the National Library were formally separated from the university and began construction of a new building outside of the campus that is scheduled to begin operation in summer of 2022. Fighting. Bergman was very appreciative in general of the support of Dr. Judah Magnus, the head of the Hebrew University, who understood the importance of the library, but on the other hand, often felt that he needed more independence. A huge change came with the moving of the Beta Spring from downtown Jerusalem to Beit Wolfson, <coughs> at Hebrew University campus on Mount Scopus that was built specifically for the purpose of housing the library. At the 13th Zionist Congress in 1924, Nachum Sakala had described this future building as the first monumental secular Jewish building in Jerusalem. The cornerstone laying took place in 1926, and the building was dedicated during Cholomoy Pesach and Passover in 1930. Here as well, various problems, and especially financial ones, of course, were at play. The stacks were supposed to have been built with a capacity for 700,000 volumes, but in fact had only room for 300,000. Uh, there was no money to buy furniture for the reading room. So while they had a periodical reading room, which you can see does have desks, etc., Ulam Priyat Kitve 8 for the periodical, but the uh, main reading room didn't have a budget for furniture. And here, this is from a booklet about Wade Wolfson, says specifically. The, uh, the, the big reading room, which is still not furnished. Okay, so this is, it actually took uh, several more years until 1934 when they were able to uh, acquire furniture for the room and begin opening it with uh, 7,000 volumes in the main reading room. By contrast, today at the main reading rooms of the National Library, there are some 200,000 uh, volumes on open stacks. More significantly, Bergman described in detail the demographic and cultural change caused by the move. In his words, I quote, the transfer of Beta Spring from downtown to Mount Scopus caused a significant change in the number and quality of the readers. And, and a quote, until this point, the library had functioned also as the public library of Jerusalem. And the reading rooms, he wrote, were constantly full, especially with workers who had come to read at the end of their workday. However, due to the distance to Mount Scopus, infrequent and relatively expensive bus travel, this ended abruptly. Says Bergman, quote, the institution thus lost its character as a popular library and about a quarter of its readers. Instead, it received the character of a scientific institution whose readership was composed of intellectuals and university students, including learned Christian clergy and intellectual Muslims, end of quote. Bergman also pointed out that with the worsening of relations between Jews and Arabs in the city, and especially after the rioting of 1929, the Beta Spring also became increasingly important as a center of historical documentation of current events as well. Today, with the main library campus housed since 1960 on the Givat Ram campus, Beit Wolfson, the building we've seen, houses the Faculty of Law of Hebrew University on the Mount Scopus. The Beta Spring also attempted to help public libraries around Palestine, both by denoting, by donating doubles books and with intralibrary loans. The connection with the public in Bergman's eyes was strengthened through exhibitions, a tradition which continues, of course, until today, in which the new building will take the form of uh, permanent as well as temporary exhibitions. Amongst the exhibitions that Bergman felt were important to highlight include those on Maimonides, the Passover Haggadah, Spinoza, the authors Bialik, Chernochovsky, and Brenner, as well as Eliezer ben Yehuda, Aleph Dal Gordon, who's been mentioned, and uh, the historian Shimon Dubnov, uh, as well on Theodor Herzl and of ancient maps of the land of Israel, which today form the basis of the famous Lor collection 
of uh, cartography at the NLI. In his words, the exhibits were an excellent means to make the public aware of the treasures of the library. He went on to lament that in 1935, the university took over the use of the exhibition hall for another project, so they had to stop having exhibitions, but he can feel at ease that in the new building there'll certainly be a fine exhibition hall. Bergman also stressed the importance of the acquisition of personal and organizational archives. He was pleased to receive those of Ushishkin, Echad Am, uh, some of the brand new <coughs> Cholovet Zion uh, organization, and of Stefan Zweig, an archive sadly enriched by his 1942 suicide note. He noted that steps were being taken to acquire that of Bialik, a project that did not come to fruition, and lamented the fact that Herzl's archives remained out of reach. Lastly, Bergman set out to build the Beta Sperm's manuscript collection, a project that really took off with the support of Magnus and the university. In 1927, Scholem had penned a long letter to Magnus urging him to find a budget for the purpose of acquiring manuscripts, and that no doubt helped as well. Bergman noted that as of 1935, the library had holdings of some 1,060 manuscripts, and that in 1930, Gershom Scholem and Issachar Yoel had published an annotated bibliography of those pertaining to Kabbalah, and in 1934, Yoel published another catalog of all the additional manuscripts. He also mentioned that the library had begun to collect photocopies of Hebrew manuscripts worldwide. This later became an institute of photocopies of manuscripts, which now includes some 70,000, the great majority of which have now been digitized in recent years as part of our Ketiv online manuscript project, which is now supplemented as well by our Maktub Arabic manuscript uh, digitization project. In terms of physical holdings, the NLI today holds approximately 10,000 Hebrew and 3,000 Arabic manuscripts. Bergman also stressed the role of the library as being a guide for other Jewish libraries, noting that he received requests from assistance from libraries in Poland, as well as the public libraries around Palestine. This was a source of great pride for him. He viewed it as an expression of Ahavad Haaretz, the love of the land. Bergman viewed Zionist cultural leaders mentioned by all of you, such as Gordon and Yosef Chaim Brenner as his inspirations. And he wrote, I quote, the librarian living in Israel needs to be filled with the Hebrew culture being created here in the land. We came here to create Hebrew culture with all of its radicalism. We need to become rooted in the land and to create a secular Hebrew culture, end of quote. These words express Bergman's vision of the library playing a central role in the development of Jewish culture in the land of Israel, a sentiment still central to the new National Library of Israel's vision today. Sadly, at the end of Bergman's 1935 report, he chose to focus not only on the fact that Beit Wolfson and von Scopus was in need of expansion, but on the massive contributions of books from Germany in light of what he called the tragedy of German Jewry in 1933. This led to the contribution of tens of thousands of volumes and was largely responsible for the overcrowding in Beit Wolfson and the development of a major catalog and backlog. But that thing the extent of the tragedy of the German Jewry in 1933. In his 1935 farewell address to his colleagues, turning over the reins to Professor Gotthold Weil, who replaced him as director, he summed up the Zionist spiritual vision of the library, referring to it as a mikdash ma'at, a small sanctuary, a term traditionally used to describe a synagogue. He continued, I quote, the younger generation doesn't get excited about what excited its parents. The Sidur, Talit, and Tefillin don't have the same holiness for them. Here is the greatness of Zionism, which gave new symbols to the people. Hatikva, the kibbutz ideal, etc. My idea, aspiration, and hope were to add one more Zionist symbol, to create a national treasure that would serve as a symbol that people would pray for and love, the house of books, end of quote. And Bergman ended his 1935 booklet on the library's history on an optimistic note stating, I quote, the National University Library is today a fact with all of its lackings and problems, it is a major undertaking of the Jewish people. Am Yisrael built it, and the same Jewish desire to build it will sustain it in the future as well. And I'd like to also to share with you this uh, uh, handwritten uh, note that sh from Sholem's order. This is Sholem's handwriting, and it's unfortunately not dated, uh, which is about things he jotted down about Bergman as a librarian, which uh, were apparently for some event in which he spoke about Shalom as a, as a librarian, so, uh, about Bergman as a librarian, these were notes to himself, uh, including the upper, upper left-hand corner where he wrote, to be a librarian in, what, in 1920, what did that exactly mean? Um, but some of the other points, just very, very briefly, he mentions, uh, he mentions that uh, Bergman was an haute de a great example of both a 
a director, uh, and he mentions in a cu couple of places his Schnorrut, his uh, Schnorring books. Uh, he appears twice. Once uh, he has also <coughs> that he wants to tell a story from the time of his Schnorring, but he doesn't. I guess he remembered the story, so he didn't share the with us in paper. Unfortunately, he says that uh, that Bergman always had a uh, a calm smile. And he describes him on the bottom as being an eternal student, constantly studying. He mentions here Hebrew, Judaism, Yiddishkeit, Yadut the Yiddishkeit, uh, Gemara, Zohar, Tanya, etc. And that he knew how to make learning come alive, which is a very a lot of nice, very nice things. So as we've seen in 1920, Bergman took over a fledgling institution with no budget or staff to speak of, few books, and a host of other problems. In a short 15 years, he succeeded in transforming it into a modern institution of great cultural and academic significance in Palestine and beyond. In some ways, he set the stage for the National Library of Israel as it exists today. In others, the many changes that Israel has gone through in the last 85 years since he retired have necessitated radical revisions of the institution's goals and methods. Nonetheless, the citizens of Israel and the Jewish people worldwide owe Shmuel Hebo Bergman a great debt of gratitude for the library, for the Beit HaSfarim as well. Thank you.